Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's NLP seminar. And today we have Pastor William Wong. William Wong is the Duncan and Susanna Melicham Chair in Artificial Intelligence and Designs and an Assistant Professor in the Department of Computer Science at the UCSB. He is the Director of UCSB's Electro Language Processing Group and the Center for Responsible Machine Learning. He received his PhD from School of Computer Science, Carnegie Mellon University. He has broad interest in machine learning approaches to data science, including statistical rela relational learning, information extraction, computational social science, and vision. He has published more than 100 papers at leading NLP, machine learning, AI, vision conferences, and journals, and received the best paper awards on nominations at uh, ASRU, CIKM, NLP, CVPR, and many other faculty research rewards from Google, Facebook, IBM, and et cetera. And so let's welcome William and enjoy his talk. Thank you, thank you, Zhao, for the very kind introduction. And it is my great honor to visit Georgia Tech again, but on a um, virtual format. And uh, I'm sure that uh, it is a very challenging and difficult week. And a lot of you probably didn't sleep last night, but uh, it's interesting, I mean, to see all these things unfolding. But hopefully today I'm going to tell you something, uh, you know, interesting in, uh, you know, just for the sake of understanding more about the science of wishing and language reasoning, okay? So uh, this is a joint work with my student, Eric, who is an assistant professor at UC Santa Cruz right now with other students, Guan Rong and the Ray and my uh, Google collaborators, Pradi, Kazu, Sugato, and many others. So let me tell you a little bit about, um, you know, a very interesting book that I read over the summer, right? So some of you know this book, it's called Book of Why. So it's not like a, um, you know, technical writing, but it's a, a very interesting sort of like popular science book by a Turing Award winner, Dave Pro. So in this book, I think, uh, Jude has a lot of interesting ideas, and one specifically, you know, he one thing he thinks that I totally agree is that a lot of these AI studies right now are mostly observational studies, right? Because typically we can't really uh, get all of the data we have. We cannot estimate the true risk, right? So we'll have to collect empirical data, analyze the static data, and you know, estimate this empirical risk, right? So the issue with doing this kind of observational studies is that uh, it's very easy to overfit, right? Because the data set you collected are often very small comparing to all of the data out there. And often it is not randomized. And neural networks specifically, they are very good at learning the spurious statistics patterns from such data. Some of you may remember there's the issue with the Stanford Natural Language Inference Dataset, right? So um, you're supposed to learn the relationship between two sentences, but turned out that you only need one sentence and you will be able to classify the relationship between two sentences. So this is clearly broken because neural networks learning that when the data set was constructed, well, sentences from this domain are likely belongs to this particular relation, right? So that we only need one sentence and we can tell the relationship between two sentences. Um, so that's why I think he proposed that we should really move from observational studies to interventional studies. So this would be in addition to just look at empirical data or just look at the static data, can we uh, make incremental decisions and teach AI agents to react to the environment and then adapt to the environment accordingly and make incremental decisions. So this would be things like AlphaGo, right? So when you uh, place a stone on the board, then you observe what the situation looks like and then the agent can uh, take uh, incremental steps to uh, be able to uh, dynamically understand the situation. So this is uh, one step, I think, beyond uh, just looking at static data. And finally, uh, he sees this, is that if you can go from observational studies to interventional studies, and then finally, you can go to counterfactual studies, right? So this would be basically trying to go to the direction of causal reasoning, right? So how do we actually understand this 
uh, causal uh, relationship between random variable in the data set. Now, uh, we don't have a lot of data because like I said, we only have uh, static data, but you can do interventional studies by asking counterfactual questions. So what if this uh, conversation didn't happen this way, right? So what if somebody's uh, said it the other way? So what will this conversation unfold? So that you get a lot of counterfactual data that you may be able to understand um, the causality. So that's uh, his thesis. But I found this very interesting and hopefully today we're going to uh, cover a little bit more about, you know, teaching agents to uh, do the dynamic uh, decision making and also leverage this counterfactual thinking in some of the studies. All right. So um, I think I don't need to motivate too much about this uh, benefit of embodied agents, right? So today's talk will be focusing on uh, embodied agents. And as you can see on the left hand side, this is a picture. Uh, you know, about the virtual care uh, by basically a robot. And um, this is something that we are familiar with because when, if you remember in March, uh, when the first COVID cases happened in the United States, uh, there were hospitals in Seattle area, they were actually using robots to take care of the patients, right? And you can imagine with an infectious disease like COVID-19, uh, certainly, if you can use robots to help measuring the vitals, help uh, bring the drugs to the patients, certainly this reduces the risk, right, for a lot of this uh, critical uh, care workers, right? So this is certainly a very interesting situation. If you can teach agents to see and talk and listen and act so they can be virtual robots and take care of, um, you know, infectious patients. Uh, on the right hand side, we do also see, you know, in the future that you could have in-home smart robots that actually help you uh, to be able to uh, do better with your housework. And then, you know, for example, if you don't know where a phone is, then you can just ask your robot to bring your cell phone to you. So that would be a very convenient. You can uh, improve the quality of life to free human from a tedious housework to actually uh, doing more creative work. So. Uh, my point is that there are a lot of interest in language and vision community since uh, 2015, 2016. Uh, but I think a lot of studies are focusing on see and the talk, right? So basically image captioning and also uh, video captioning. How can you go from the vision to the lens side, right? So this is captioning. But uh, we can also uh, teach agents to understand the visual environments and teach agents to act accordingly, such that our agents can perform situated language understanding and then basically uh, listen and act accordingly to the visual environment. So if you close the loop, then uh, this would be actually a very interesting uh, for, for embodied agents to understand the visual environments and also be able to interpret the human language and then act accordingly in the visual environment. So. Um, I also want to uh, mention a little bit about why there are some benefits of using embodied agents, right? So why there are some benefits of using simulation? The reason is because um, some people actually have a robotics background and you know that it's very difficult to parallelize the experiments with robots, right? And also uh, there are a lot of platforms and benchmarks out there. It's very difficult to compare the performance. And finally, um, you know, mechanical issue is a still a very big issue with real robots, right? So it can take you days to set up an experiment, but still very fragile uh, with this mechanical issue. So that's why we think uh, we can teach machines to actually understand how to react in the real world by building very realistic uh, simulation environments, right? So for example, some of you are familiar with this metaphor 3D environment. And basically, uh, you know, we can do a lot of cool things with the environment. For example, vision language navigation. Uh, the agent, the robot, will have the first person view of the visual scene. And then for uh, the human, we'll give uh, language instructions. For example, leave the living room, go through the hallway with paintings on the wall and head to the kitchen stop next to the wooden dining table, right? So the agent basically has the access to the instruction and also the visual environment 
uh, and the agent can turn left, turn right, look up, look down, go forward, and stop. So this is the vision and language uh, navigation problem. And on the right hand side, you see this video is actually this agent is performing uh, the navigation according to the human instruction, and finally reach the destination. So uh, this is the task that we're going to focus today. I'll tell you why I think it's an exciting task to ground natural language is because the evaluation is fairly clear, right? In this case, that uh, unlike natural language generation, that sometimes it's very difficult to evaluate the quality of the generated sentences. In vision and language navigation, in this case, we can often evaluate whether the agent has reached the target or not, right? Because you know exactly where the target is and you know exactly where your agent is and you can calculate the distance, right? Between where the agent stopped and where the final destination is. And you can measure uh, success and you can measure error very easily. So that's, I think, one thing very intriguing about this task is that you can do very precise evaluation about language grounding. All right. So I just gave you a brief overview about this task. Uh, next, I will tell you a little bit more about some of the challenges in vision language navigation and also tell you uh, some issues we run into and our solution. Uh, and next, uh, we'll share with you some of our uh, recent solutions in dealing with the data scarcity issue in vision language navigation. Then we'll conclude and I'll answer uh, more questions towards the end. All right, so let's look at the issues with vision and language navigation. So one issue, as you can see, is clearly cross-model grounding, right? So if you have text and you have uh, uh, visual inputs, how would you be able to teach the robot to ground this uh, instructions, human instructions in natural language into this uh, visual environment, right? So this is the interesting aspect. And as you can see, there are a lot of objects, right, in the instruction and you will need to teach the agent to uh, create a mapping between these uh, regions of pixel to the objects, right? Then the robot can perform the navigation. And on the left-hand side, you see this top-down view. This is not visible to the agent, but you can see uh, it is very intuitive that the agent can start at this position and then trying to reach the destination. And the only input is basically the text, and on the right-hand side, when the agent moves around the room, the agent will see different local visual environment. So what are some challenges? So like I said, in addition to ground text into a visual representation, there's also the issue uh, of this ear post feedback, right? For example, consider these two uh, trajectories, right? On the left-hand side, you have a pretty nice trajectory and it's very uh, similar to shortest path that it follows the instruction and reaches the destination. On the right-hand side, you have an Asian wandering around in the room and accidentally stopped at the target location, right? So then uh, this is a weird situation because if you're using reinforcement learning to teach the agent to do navigation, at the end of the day, uh, the reward signal is very similar, right? Because at the end of the day, if you're only using the target location to see uh, whether I should encourage this to pass, while well, there's no difference, right, between left and right. So both trajectory are considering the same in terms of success signal, right? So if you're only doing RL with the final reward, there's really no difference because both uh, reach the target. But in reality, you would prefer the one on the left because the one on the left creates a more shorter path. And you certainly don't want the agent to wander in your home for about 30 minutes to actually reach the target, right? So uh, that's the difference. But so far in this framework, it's impossible to tell. So that's why uh, we actually thought about uh, two solutions. One is that the agent will have to still come to the right place, right? The second thing is that we also want to use reinforcement learning to teach the agent to stay on the right path. So if it follows the human instruction, but not wandering around the room, then it is very good solution, right? So uh, let's first talk about the first solution, which is come to the right place. Like I said, this could be very uh, easy to implement that we only need to train a reasoning navigator that takes the history of the trajectory 
takes the human instruction, the local visual scenes, and this will be the input uh, to this agent, and it will take actions, right, based on uh, the state information and the environment will output the new visual scene, and the agent can navigate accordingly. So this is sort of the representation for the uh, reasoning navigator, and we do have the visual trajectory, right? So this is uh, what we've seen in the past. So we encode all of the previous information to memorize the past, and meanwhile, we have the current uh, uh, instruction, and then we can recognize the current state by creating a tension between the trajectory and also the uh, language encoder. Uh, so both of them are, were encoded in LSTM. And then um, we have this local uh, environment, which is the current view, right, of vision. So all the three feet of the information will be uh, fed into this action predictor and the action predictor will finally uh, make a prediction uh, based on the history, the text, and also the visual environment to decide uh, where it should go next, okay? And uh, like I said, uh, we can use a reinforcement learning uh, reward. Basically, this is what we call an actionistic reward to see whether the Asian, right, has reduced the distance to the target or not, right? So this will be the reward and whether the agent has successfully went into the radius, right, of the target, right? If you came into the radius, that it means uh, it has successfully uh, finished the task. And we can basically use this um, as the uh, extrinsic reward to teach the agent to go to the target. Um, so this is only the first part. Again, it doesn't solve the issue of uh, ill post feedback we still need to come up with another solution to be able to teach the agent to stay on the right path. And to do that, he came up with the idea of matching critic to generate intrinsic rewards to help the agent to map uh, its current status to the instruction and make sure that we follow the instruction. So how did we do that? Well, one thing you can think about the matching critics is that these are the captioning models. So based on the trajectory, based on the uh, sequence of actions you perform with this local environment, now I can take them as, uh, you know, basically uh, videos, right? And then I can do video captioning and basically use this trajectory encoder, this encoder decoder model to decode the language, right? From this latent representation of this sort of like videos, right? Or a sequence of images. And then uh, we can try to generate the instruction. And at the end, we can compare the generated instruction with the original instruction so that we know how far off are we in terms of uh, the generated uh, 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 instruction. And we know how far we're off, right, comparing to the good trajectory that we should be following according to the original instruction. So this is the intrinsic reward that we're using this sort of like a video captioning model to reconstruct the instruction to encourage a global matching between our trajectory and what was given in the instruction. So um, at the end of the day, you will be able to see a difference because we can easily plot the success and failure cases of the RL agents. And we can look at the distribution of the intrinsic rewards uh, for both success and failure cases. And we can actually see that with just the intrinsic reward that you'll be able to um, tell apart, right, these two uh, distributions. Um, so uh, the big picture for the reinforced cross-model matching model basically has uh, two components, right? So one is the extrinsic reward, basically RL reward that we check at the end of the day, did we get to the target or not? And for the intrinsic reward, this is how we are actually encouraging our agent to be able to stay on the path by doing a uh, matching critic and use the matching critic to generate uh, the caption such that we can compare with the instruction and see whether you are far off from the path or not, right? So these are the two um, rewards. And for the evaluation, we're using the room-to-room uh, -room data set. So this is the data set created uh, by Peter Anderson at CVPR. And uh, this uh, training set, it has a lot of, um, you know, environments. And in the test set, there are two different settings. 
One is the same environments that we see in this uh, same home in the training scenario. And there are uh, more realistic settings like the unseen environments that we have not seen this uh, room, this home before, right? So how will the agent react in unseen environments? So this will really test the performance of a, uh, a generalization, right, for this reinforcement learning agent. And as you can see, uh, the results are actually quite different, right, for these two testing scenarios. Uh, the speaker follower model was the earlier model proposed by UC Berkeley and CMU team. And you can see that the speaker follow models has a very big gap, right, between this uh, seen and unseen environments. Whereas for human, we can get to about 86% uh, accurate, right, for this navigation problem. Whereas uh, for the uh, RCM model, we slightly close the gap, so it's about 23% uh, gap. Uh, but later on, I will tell you a little bit more about uh, how we actually bridge the gap. Uh, with a focus on generalization. Um, any questions at this point? Be more questions at the end of the talk. Okay, sounds good. So uh, then we'll uh, wait until the end of the uh, talk to answer your questions. All right, so let's talk about generalization, right? So I think generalization is the most exciting part because um, in reality, there are still a lot of issues, right, with this simulation-based approach. For example, you can imagine that uh, if I want to create a lot of this 3D room scan, right, to be able to increase uh, the uh, generalization such that my agent can see all these different room types, this is very expensive, right? So again, when you're creating this 3D room scan, it is still a manual process and it's very limited and expensive, slightly better than, you know, having robots to uh, do the actual thing. But 3D room scan is still very difficult to collect. And again, uh, once you have the 3D room scan and you ask human uh, to generate the instruction, uh, this could be also very, uh, expensive, right? And it is very difficult to collect uh, these instructions in the interactive environments as well. So the data scarcity is definitely an issue in vision language navigation and other embodied AI uh, problems. So uh, here we mentioned a couple of solutions. One is what we call self supervised imitation learning. So this is coupled with the RCM paper. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about our recent work on adversarial path sampling and also multimodal style transfer to improve the performance for this problem. All right, so um, self-supervised imitation learning. So what do we mean by that? Well, this is specifically designed to deal with the unseen environment in the VLN task, right? So if you think about the static problems, if you think about observational studies, our philosophy and what we taught in the machine learning class is that there's a training set, there's a development set, and there's a test set. So uh, you're not supposed to touch the test set until the very last minute that you finish the hyperparameter tuning and model training on the development set and the training set, right? However, if you think about this particular task, now, if you're going to deploy this trained agent in somebody's home, right? So let's say if you ship your product uh, with a smart home assistant, now if you deploy this in a different environment, why can't you actually use your agent to explore this unseen environment, right? So this is totally fine. And actually a lot of these agents are doing this already that it, when you, let's say use a new uh, embodied agent that in this case, it can e explore uh, your room to understand the environment better. So in this case, we propose this uh, self-supervised imitation learning to help explore the unseen environment, right? Using only self-supervision so that the agent can better adapt to this new environment so that we can actually try to change the unseen environment to the seen environment, right? And the idea is to actually look at, uh, again, the matching critic and the replay buffer. So the, the way we do it is that in the training time, right, we can basically let the navigator perform multiple runs, and then we can use the matching critic to evaluate these trajectories, right, to rank these trajectories, and then we can save the best ones 
into the replay buffer. And in this case, in the testing time, right? So in this uh, new testing environment, unseen environment, then we can let the navigator to imitate, right, the saved trajectories in the replay buffer, and we can compare the new paths with the good paths we've seen in the replay buffer. And in this case, uh, the agent is basically learning from its own past good behavior and trying to adapt and approximate a better policy in this unseen environment, right? So this is uh, the main idea about the self-supervised imitation learning idea. And on the left-hand side, you will see an example of uh, the agent before we applying the seal, right? So the instruction is head towards the kitchen, walk forward and stop beside the bottom of the step facing the double white doors, right? So in this case, you can see that before we apply seal, the model actually got stuck in the room and was not able to um, get out of the room. Whereas on the right-hand side, this is after we applied seal, right? So you can see that agent basically is following the instruction and successfully added the room and uh, walking towards uh, the double white door and stop at the target location. So this is a very ideal situation. And as you can see, here are the qualitative uh, uh, results. Um, uh, quantitative results after we apply uh, the seal model to the RCN model, and we can successfully cut down uh, this uh, gap in generalization for seen and unseen environment by a large margin, and we can get to about 61% of the performance in the unseen environment after we apply self-supervised imitation learning. And another good thing about this approach is that it can also improve the efficiency by bringing down the average pass length from about 15 meters to nine meters, right? The shorter pass, the better the performance of the agent. All right, so uh, the second thing I want to mention is that, um, of course, I think if the agent can explore the, and adapt to the environment, this would be really nice, we can do seal, but not all of the navigation agents can actually do this, right? For example, in disaster relief, if there's a nuclear leak, right, let's say in Japan, in this case, uh, there's no way that we can do exploration and adaptation, right, in those very difficult situations. So how do we do better? Well, uh, we can think about, you know, other solutions, for example, uh, data augmentation to do, uh, to deal with this. And when we think about the data augmentation, well, we can actually use a data augmentation with the speaker model, right, in the speaker follower model. And what it does is that it basically um, randomly sample the paths, right, in this environment, and then use the speaker model, which is kind of like the critic model in our case, uh, to generate, right, this caption, uh, which is in instruction in this case. And then we can take the instruction and this path and use them as augmented data, right? So then we can add this augmented data to the training set and increase the size of the training data. And we can do arbitrarily many, right, additional data using this speaker model to generate instructions for randomly sampled paths. Now, um, if you look at the performance, well, the performance is okay, right? If you look at, for example, from 0% to 100% of augmented data, you see the validation data set seeing success rate has improved from 39% to 42%, but it sort of gets stuck around 42 and 43%, right? Uh, so we see this is not very uh, efficient because uh, you don't actually see it growing and actually keep very static with the speaker model. So that's why we came up with this idea of adversarial path sampling and trying to uh, basically teach the agent to learn from increasingly challenging paths. So for example, in this case, while well, um, the navigator is trying to lower the loss, right? So it's basically uh, trying to do better in the navigation problems, given the passing instructions, where the APS with the adversarial path sampler is trying to maximize the loss because we're trying to learn a more challenging path, right? Uh, that in this case, if you can feed more and more challenging paths, uh, in this case, the navigator uh, can also learn from challenging paths and do better uh, in those difficult cases. 
So uh, this is uh, sort of the idea for this uh, recent ECCV paper that instead of randomly sampled paths, we do see a much better performance when we're using uh, adversarial path sampling that the performance can keep growing because the agent is not just learning from randomly sampled paths, but it's learning from increasingly more difficult paths to improve the performance. And here's the result on the R2R R2 data set. And we can see once we apply it with the random sampling, we do see an improvement over three models. And when we apply the APS approach, and we also see a further improvement over the random sampling approach. Um, so the other thing I want to mention is that um, in addition to doing pre-exploration, in addition to do data augmentation, uh, it could still be difficult, right, for, uh, you know, navigation in very complicated environments. And there are certain limitations of the speaker model. For example, if you pre-train this speaker model on room-to-room -room data set, it may not work very well for outdoor environment, right? So, for example, in this case, if you want to do a more challenging uh, task, then we can consider this auto VLN settings, whereas we are going to teach the agent to see more complicated and more diverse visual perceptions, and then it will basically see longer paths, more complex search uh, space, and you will see more linguistically challenging um, instructions and limited number of uh, human annotations because of the search space is much larger. So in this case, we're teaching an agent to navigate in New York City. How will the agent do? Well, it turned out that if you're just using the speaker model to generate additional data, it will not work well because the speaker model was trained in indoor environments, right? And you're trying to apply it in outdoor environments directly. It gives you a lot of errors actually highlighted in red in this example. So that's why in our work, we thought about leveraging external resources such as the Google Street View so that we can take uh, this very large uh, Google Street View data set that captures all of this, uh, you know, Google Street Map uh, navigation uh, trajectories together with this machine generated instructions and use this as additional data to be able to uh, train the model. But one thing we should notice is that this instruction style in this Google map is very different from human description. So that we do need to come up with a new approach to do style transfer and be able to turn this automatically generated instructions into human instructions. So uh, this is our recent work on multimodal text style transfer to be able to do this task. So basically, like I said, for auto vision language navigation problems, we do have human annotated instructions, but again, uh, we do need to do a style transfer to turn this external API generated instruction from Google Street View into a stylized instructions such that the agents can successfully use this, right, to do uh, pre-training for our vision language navigation model. Um, and later on, we can fine tune it on this uh, data set. Um, and this is what a human annotated instruction looks like. So uh, basically, as you can see, this is very different, right, from this uh, API generated uh, instructions. But one thing we can do is that we can still use the mass language modeling approach to mask the keyword in the human annotated instructions. And then basically, we're teaching this multimodal style transfer. Uh, model to automatically fill out the blank, right? To fill out this masked area to try to reconstruct, right? The, um, to recover the text. And the reason why we do this on a human instruction is that as you can imagine, now we're going to do the same for app API based, uh, generated instructions. So we're going to mask the key areas. And then we're going to use our train the model, right, from the previous slide, from the, the model trained on the human generated data to automatically fill in the blank, such that in this case, we can automatically uh, turn this API generated instructions into the style like the one uh, given in the human instruction. And 
uh, this is the performance on outdoor uh, navigation. And then uh, we're, before we look at the detail, we first look at the cell lines instruction and look at the quality. So basically, if you're using speaker, the results are not very good comparing to the ground truth. But then when you're using multimodal textile transfer, we can see the performance is significantly better. And uh, in this case, uh, uh, this result is uh, much better because we're using outdoor environment and we're using a much larger uh, external Google Street View data set to do the pre-training. And the only thing we need to do is to do multimodal style transfer such that the style is actually similar to the ground truth human instruction. And um, the other thing um, that I didn't uh, mention is that in the earlier work, we're using the LSTM-based navigation framework. So that was uh, a while back. And uh, recently, we also used this uh, transformer-based navigation model, which is pretty much similar. You still encode the uh, visual representation and the instruction, but you just have a cross-model transformer to actually help you uh, to make the prediction. So. Uh, nothing is uh, significantly different. It's just the network architecture was changed into this uh, transformer-based approach. Uh, just to give you a head up about this uh, setting in the data set, and uh, like I said, we're using this touchdown data set for outdoor environment. This contains the human instructions, and uh, Street Learn is the Google Street View data set, and the instruction uh, basically human map uh, uh, Google Map API, and we do need to turn Google Map API generated instruction into the style of the touchdown data set, which are created by uh, human annotators. And we call this augmented uh, generated data set M50 data set. And we can see that once we apply this M50 data set on a uh, different uh, metric in this outdoor navigation, we do see uh, improvements when we're using the M50 data set. And once we're doing the style transfer, uh, the performance got significantly better with this multimodal style transfer approach to improve uh, the um, pre-training of the large external resources. All right, so uh, just to briefly conclude what I said today. So I think uh, hopefully you get more understanding about this vision language navigation problem I think it's super exciting because uh, you can easily evaluate this visually grounded language reasoning uh, problem, right? So like I said, unlike the generation problem, it's very difficult to evaluate. Now, uh, for this particular problem, you know where exactly your agent stop, and you can measure the distance between where it stop and the ground truth location so that you have a pretty nice uh, quantitative method to measure the quality right, of language grounding. And secondly, um, we show that using intrinsic reward and self-supervised imitation learning improve the vision and language navigation agents. And we also show that with the idea of counterfactual data augmentation, and we implement this idea using LSL path sampling, we can keep teaching the agents to improve its navigation performance by looking at more and more challenging paths. Uh, and we can use adversarial learning as a framework to, uh, to conduct this counterfactual debt augmentation process such that we can learn the interventional distributions from what we haven't seen before. And finally, um, um, I also think that the idea of multimodal style, st uh, multimodal style transfer learning can help us uh, to teach agents to make better actions here we're looking at a special case of uh, Google Street Map, apply those knowledge learned from large Google Street View into a uh, real world uh, navigation problem in outdoor environments. There are still a lot of open challenges, I think, in this space. And um, one thing we've been looking at recently is this uh, Riveri data set uh, created jointly with University of Adelaide and uh, Georgia Tech. So basically, this is a, a referring expression vision language navigation problem. And um, like I said, there were some criticism about this original VLN problem because uh, the instructions are very long, right? So let's say if you really have a robot, probably you're not going to give very long instructions. So Riveri is one step further comparing to the existing 
a VLN problem because uh, in Reverie, we give very short instructions. For example, uh, go get my cell phone, right? So this is the only instruction that we give to the agent. So very short uh, instruction about the task, but the agent need to navigate by itself, right, in the home uh, to be able to find a target. So definitely much more challenging because you're referring to the objects and there could be ambig ambiguations and uh, it could be uh, very difficult for the agent to navigate in the room uh, environment. But we say that this is still a very important direction to go forward and to make the VLN task more critical. Uh, the second challenge we created is the multilingual aspect. So uh, in addition to look at uh, you know, monolingual vision language navigation, we do have this multilingual video captioning and we have a multilingual um, navigation there as well. So this is certainly uh, interesting to look at whether uh, different culture and different languages can help us learn more about the um, vision language uh, reasoning problems in this dynamic environments. And finally, there are two um, open challenges that we created also on this multimodality input, but not language innovation, but actually tables and tags. So uh, this is also a challenge. How do we teach machines to reason with digital genius input? So tag flag is basically table-based based fact checking. If you have a sentence, can you teach the agent to verify against the table? Um, and this will be challenging because uh, there are two modalities, there are text, and there's also tabular data. Uh, and this is the tab back, uh, challenge. And finally, there's also this uh, hybrid QA data set we recently created on question answering on heterogeneous data. And now if you ask the question, can the agent do reasoning on text data and also the table data uh, at the same time, right? To be able to answer multi-hop question. And all of them, I think, are uh, pretty interesting multimodal and uh, they're all concerned with reasoning with Cito Genius input. Finally, I want to acknowledge and thank all of my collaborators for this work, and i um, happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yeah, thanks for the interesting work. And yeah, we, have, we do have several questions. So the first one is uh, for the instruction in coding as these contain directions and place names. I wonder how semantic parsing types of instructions compare to current LSTM encoding. Also, are there any ablation studies showing which components the intrinsic or extrinsic reward helps more? Right, uh, so this is a great question, right? So we didn't do specifically like semantic parsing. So this is a very interesting uh, question because uh, the whole thing with the vision language navigation framework that we created is more or less, you know, end to end in the sense that we do not have symbolic representation of the objects, right? So we do not know that, well, here's text, we first do semantic parsing and we find out this is exactly the kitchen that is, for example, the hallway and we're trying to learn the relationship. But all of this actually down in, um, you know, end to end deep learning fashion and then all of them is encoded in the latent representation of the trajectory of the uh, tags. And then we're using attention, right, to be able to learn uh, the mapping between the objects and also the trajectory and also the current environment. So uh, in short answer is that there is no explicit semantic parsing, right, in uh, what we're doing. But I think this could be an interesting direction to go forward and think about how we're able to, um, you know, make it more interpretable, right? So, uh, so that's the first question. What was your second question again? Oh, the second is: uh, Are there any application studies showing which component, uh, the intrinsic or extrinsic reward, helps more? Right, that's a good question, right? So, um, I don't remember the detail. Probably we can check the papers. I think there are some ablation studies about this two reward, but. The challenge with only extrinsic reward is that it's pretty bad in the sense that it will give you very long past, right? So early days, now, I think the uh, past length for the VLN data set is very long, like 20 meters or even longer than that. But 
uh, with this uh, intrinsic reward, it can certainly cut down the pass lengths, right, to less than 10 meters, to about 7 meters to 8 meters. So uh, what we can see is that for specific metrics like lens, certainly we see a big difference uh, in terms of the uh, performance of these two uh, approaches. But if you're looking at success only, right, so uh, indeed we do see uh, uh, you know, very uh, good result with the action seek reward, but I think it depends on what metrics we're we talking about here. Okay, cool. And the next question is, uh, would you like to provide more details about how to make the augmentation part work as it involves structures, instructions, procedures for navigations, especially from a speaker-centric fashion? Right. Um, I think that's a great question. So uh, thanks, D.E., for asking this question. I don't know if D.E. still remember that in 2015, we had this uh, Yemen LP paper that we actually doing data augmentation at the time. And the, the, the thing I did was like really, uh, you know, simple at the time. I was basically replacing some keywords with its nearest neighbors. Right? And then I create a lot more instances for those tweets and I use those tweets uh, to do classification, I got and I got much better result, right? So um, I think yeah. it's interesting because if you now talk about counterfactual reasoning, that's exactly counterfactual reasoning that you haven't seen other tweets, but you are trying to manipulate your static data or your observational data to create this interventional distribution about what could happen, right? And you use those uh, to improve the performance. But in our case, in this case, uh, I think the big difference with this uh, ECCV paper is that we specifically look for more challenging paths, right? Uh, but in the old work that we don't know whether this sentence is more challenging or not. Uh, in this case, the way we can do it is to set up this adversarial framework. So I think uh, the fact that if you can use adversarial learning to do data augmentation, this is cool because we show that unlike that you randomly sample the uh, the paths, if you specifically choose the ones that are difficult, that can improve the performance of the navigator. You can think about the easy cases like SVM, right? So SVM is a good example because you, it's a large margin classifier and only the ones on the margin make the difference, right? So you can think about those cases is that if I choose the easy example to do augmentation, the easy examples are far away from the margin, right? Those are not going to help you because, you know, your classifiers depends on the margin. Uh, I think the similar situation here that uh, for a lot of these learners that if you're given it very simple negative examples or very simple examples to augment it, it will not help you because it's just too simple. And when you see difficult cases in the test set, it's not helping. But once you're looking at this adversarial scenario, you're sort of like narrowing the margin, right? That by actually looking at examples closer to the margin. And um, I think that's the reason uh, why uh, this is working. So um, I think the fact that we can use adversarial learning to do data augmentation uh, is kind of like a very interesting thought that um, we uh, came up with in this particular paper. Right. Yeah, and towards the data augmentation, I actually have another question. So as you mentioned, like the, using the adversarial training, we could create some hard examples. So how do you think about like the trade-off between the, the hard examples and noisy examples? So, so we may like generate some noisy da uh, augmented data and that those data will like lead to the poor performance of models. Right. Yeah. So I think that's a, that's a good question uh, because certainly uh, there could be noise in this problem. And I think that's also the issue with uh, adversarial learning. And again, and sometimes uh, if you don't have very good pre-trained models, then uh, it's very difficult to get GAN working because you're starting with noise and the noise just propagates in the GAN model and the discriminator actually failed to perform the task. And the signal that the generator obtained from the discriminator is very poor. So that's why I think pre-training is important for the generator and for the discriminator, such that at least you will have to warm start, right, your uh, navigator 
uh, such that at least it knows the basic direction rather than uh, just feeding directly noise right to the navigator. So that is impossible. There's always, I think, a bit of between exploitation and exploration in this adversarial learning framework as well, that uh, if it's all of it is uncertainty, right? So all of it is basically, um, you know, high entropy, then the agent will perform poorly, like you mentioned. So this is a high noise setting. But if it's always zero uncertainty and zero entropy, uh, then it's also bad because it's basically just doing the simple paths, right? So it's not learning to deal with the difficult paths. So I think the balance is important that uh, what we found in past few years is that if you can warm start your agent, right, at least it has some basic knowledge about this particular task, then you inject uh, some uncertainty. This is healthy because the agent learns to deal with uh, more difficult cases. So I think the specific strategy really matters. If you start with just, uh, you know, code start again or code start RL, usually this will not work very well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and uh, another question might be a more general. So, have, uh, so uh, in the in the data computation uh, paper you just uh, you just shared. So, have you ever like tried to like visualize so which data are you generated? So, like, can you find some like Kenya's neighbors or some sort of thing like that to visualize? So, what exactly the augmented data is? Right, yeah, so I think in this case, uh, certainly uh, we can do visualization and see what the uh, the path looks like. And specifically, I think uh, for different models, we can apply this approach and we can, so basically the paths are different, right? When you are applying yeah. this approach to either speaker or the RCM or other uh, navigation models, but we do see uh, some very interesting cases of, for example, how do you get around of this room? How do you get out of the room? So it offers some different solutions of getting out of the room or uh, getting uh, navigated in this uh, hallway. So there are certainly uh, some very interesting uh, solutions. But again, I think the interesting thing is that the room-to-room -room data set is indoor. So it's a relatively, I would say, uh, restricted environment. But you can think about applying a similar approach in, uh, for example, AlphaGo or apply this in outdoor navigation. I think it could be potentially more useful because uh, then we'll need to deal with a much larger search space and then you may actually have more constraints. Uh, so that could be an interesting application in the future to consider data augmentation in more challenging settings. Okay, uh, let me see if there are, are some more questions. Okay, it seems that there's no more questions. Maybe if you are, yeah, I see like Wei mentioned that is have she has to run for assistive defense. Okay, uh, if there's no more questions, I think we can end up here. And for those who, for those who have like missed the, the talk, they can watch the videos and they may like, send the emails or to you or me to ask for more questions and I will connect both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Zhao, for setting this up. It was a, a great event, and hopefully uh, we can connect uh, in the near future and see each other in the future. Thank you. Yeah, 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 sure. Bye-bye. Cool. So, mm -hmm. bye. Mm -hmm.